These elite families uh, come out of the ancient world. Babylon was a great center for them. And where, where was Babylon? In what we now call Iraq. Um, the invasion of Iraq is not just about oil. It's not just about one thing. It's about many things. And, and one, one thing it's about is the historical connection that these um, controlling elite families have to that area, which was Sumer and was Babylon thousands of years BC and is now Iraq. Um, they then expanded into Europe and became the uh, European aristocracy and royal families. They were involved in the Roman Empire. They were involved in the British Empire. And um, what has uh, happened over the last uh, couple of hundred years is that this uh, whole agenda, going back thousands of years, has become more and more focused and, and more and more possible with the introduction of computers and other technology that has allowed centralization of power uh, on a global scale like never before. And uh, some of the uh, people involved are famous uh, families like the Rothschild dynasty, um, like the Rockefellers, like the British royal family, the German royal family as it is. I know it's hard for people to grasp at first how it's possible for a few to control the many, i.e. Um, six billion in the end. But it's a very simple structure. And if you look at the Russian doll situation and, and you use pyramids instead, if you uh, go to a bank and you hand over your, your, your dollars to the, uh, to the cashier, that cashier does not know what's being decided in the bank manager's office behind them. He doesn't know what's happening at the next level of the bank, at the next level, the next level, until you've got a few at the top of the bank who are the real people and only people that really know what that bank's about. That bank pyramid then goes into a bigger pyramid and a bigger pyramid until you've got one that encompasses the whole of the global banking system. And at the top of that are a very few interbreeding families. Now, the same uh, applies to transnational corporations and the oil cartel and the pharmaceutical cartel. And it's the same with governments. It's the same with um, all these institutions and areas of society that have control over people's choices and therefore people's lives. And in this way of what they call compartmentalization, you have the ability for a few people to feed the same policies, the same agenda, down all these apparently unconnected areas of life. Therefore, it is no accident or coincidence that in politics, in uh, transnational corporations, in banking, in education, in all these areas, the incessant centralization of power has gone on and on and on and on. We're seeing it now uh, politically with the European Union here. You know, the, the, the British government can hardly breathe now without um, getting permission from Europe. Where's their power? Their power is in the people saying, oh, well, I don't like it, but it's the law, and so we better obey it. You know, okay, um, we've had a discussion. Um, and we've decided we're going to introduce a law today where we're going to take our children, fr uh, your children from you, okay? And we're going to put them in a, uh, a national education centre and we're going to control them. And maybe you can see them twice a year, okay? We're passing the legislation this afternoon. Would you accept that? Would parents accept that? What would they do? They'd stand up and say, we're not having this. So there is a point then where, in, where people en masse will say, enough. It's just a case of when are we going to say that? Are we going to say it now while we still have some time to bring an end to this nonsense? Or are we going to start saying we're not having that at the point when they're introducing legislation to take our children away? And by then, people brave people who've stood up and been counted in the years before while, while the others uh, just look the other way, they're actually not going to be around to speak on behalf of the people having their children taken away. So are we going to make a stand now and draw a line in the sand and say here and no further, in fact we're going to roll this back? Or are we going to wait until it's got really, really extreme 
by which time there'll be so much infrastructure in place that drawing a line in the sand will be a serious challenge. And it's no good. I said to some policemen in Parliament Square a few months ago, ask yourself when your child says to you, Mummy and Daddy, what were you doing when the police state was introduced? Oh, oh, well, I was watching, um, I was watching the telly, honey. Or in the policeman's case, I was helping to introduce it, dear. That's the situation we're facing. And, and you know, if people don't like it, well, they just have to do the other thing, because this is how it is. And we either face it now, or we face it a little bit further along the road, when if we think it's not very good now, it'll be a bloody nightmare by then. It's time to lift the arse off the sofa and bring an end to this nonsense. Because otherwise, um, we're just building our own prison cell or sitting around where someone does it. Is that sensible? I think not. The great buzz phrase in global politics is now international law. What is international law? It is a law that everyone on the planet has to obey. Uh, orgasmic and indeed essential for anyone who wants, to, wants a global dictatorship. Laws that everyone on the planet has to obey. International law is the means of imposing the dictatorship. And it's being done covertly by this pyramid within pyramid system. And it's this Russian doll pyramid system that allows the same legislation to be introduced in different countries all over the world and to be used in the same way because it's all answerable to the top of the pyramid. And that's how it works and it's dead simple because it is essential that um, as few people as possible are aware of what is actually the game, what is actually the, uh, the outcome they're leading towards, because people in general don't want themselves and their children to be um, enslaved by some uh, uh, malevolent centralized global dictatorship. Uh, so as many people as possible have to be kept out of the loop, and this compartmentalization allows them to do it. I um, met a CIA scientist um, some years ago now, back in 1997. Uh, he wanted to let people know what was coming. And in his situation, it was uh, impossible for him to do so. Uh, I said to him, um, if you are so against what's happening, why don't you just refuse to do it? And he opened his shirt, and on his chest was a see-through um, plastic sachet, like a shampoo sachet, with an orangey-golden liquid in it. And he said, this is why I can't speak out. And these things are known within the CIA as patches. Someone's been patched. And what happened was that this... Uh, man joined the CIA uh, because of his genius in the area of magnetics and electrics and what have you. And he thought he was serving his country, a compartmentalized pyramid. And uh, he then realized that this agenda for the global dictatorship, the global police state, was no conspiracy theorist fantasy. It was actually true. And he refused to work for them. He then left home one day and has missing time. Um, he remembers nothing until he woke up on a kind of medical type bench in a room and as he got his faculties back he realized there was something stuck to his chest and it was this see-through um, sachet with this liquid in it and what it happens is that their bodies are manipulated in their lost time period to need the drug in this patch to survive and it has to be replaced every 72 hours and if they do not comply by using their genius to advance the technology necessary for global human control, then the patch is not replaced and they die a very uh, uh, desperately horrible death. And uh, he told me um, about the fact that technology exists to create abundant growth in deserts without water by resonating the natural electrical fields of the plants so they grow so fast, as he put it, it at its optimum it's like a time-lapse photograph. 
There is no need for hunger on this planet. Hunger is not there by uh, the fact that it has to happen. It's there by design for a very simple reason. When people have abundance, they have choice. And when people have choice, they have freedom. Abundance equals choice equals freedom. So what the elite do is they manipulate scarcity. So scarcity equals dependency equals control. And he said there's no need for hunger because the technology exists to create abundant growth anywhere. He also said to me, if tell people that if they say no to one thing, say no to the microchip. Because he said it's not just about electronic tagging, it's about the ability to manipulate people's behavior, mentally, emotional, and physical health from a distance just by sending uh, signals to the chip. So you put all that together, and that's the kind of world we're going to be living in um, if we allow this uh, incessant process of imposing the police state to get to the, uh, the goal that it has been aiming towards for so long. The greatest form of human manipulation, in fact there's two but they're interconnected, are what I call problem reaction solution and the totalitarian tiptoe. Problem reaction solution is the term I, I coined to describe a system whereby you create the problem. 9 11 is a classic. Um, you don't even need a real problem. There is a version of this which I call no problem reaction solution, like weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You only need the perception of a problem. You get people to believe there's a problem, and a problem needs a solution. And so you get the, the people who covertly create problems like 9-11 and terrorism, and they then blame someone else to hide the fact that they're really the ones behind it. They then use a pathetic mainstream media, an unquestioning mainstream media, to tell the people the version of the event, 9-11, whatever it is, that the elite want the people to believe, i.e. Osama bin Laden from the cave in Afghanistan orchestrated um, the attacks on September the 11th. You know, I've just seen Donald Duck walk behind you. Um, and then, to, to protect the people from this terrorism, which we've created, don't tell anybody, though, they then offer the solutions to the problems they've created. And those solutions are to change society in precisely the same the way that the agenda demands. And what happens with problem reaction solution and the naive people, thanks to the naive people that believe it's for their protection, things that changes in society that the people would normally oppose by reflex action are either not opposed on, on the scale uh, it normally would be, or are allowed or encouraged to go through because they are a solution to a perceived problem. And you hear it all the time. Well, I know it's taking our freedoms away and all that, but, you know, what can you do? You've got to protect people from the terrorists. And what we are going to see more of as these years unfold is more chaos problems created to create more fear, because that's the four-letter word that controls the world. Once people are in fear, they look outside of themselves for someone or something to protect them from what they've been manipulated to fear. A population or a person who's not in fear is a nightmare to manipulate and control. Someone who's in fear, piece of cake. So en masse, it's about creating chaos, it's about creating fear, and then offering ways out of the chaos and those ways out will be more and more um, imposition of the uh, police state to protect the people and to bring order out of chaos.